Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you as we come now to the preaching of your word. And Lord, you have loved us so much that you would even now provide us with your words of life, bread for our souls, food for our souls. And Lord, where would we be without your word? And we thank you that you would be so kind to think about us in our weak state and provide for us. Today, may we look to your example for the case of our husbands, that we may walk as those faithful husbands spoken of in your word. Give us the strength, but now give us hearing, comprehension, and Lord, willingness to receive that which you have prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this Lord's Day evening, we continue our meditations on the biblical husband. And probably by now, you have a line in your Bibles at Genesis 2.24, um, because you often open it. Now, according to the Word of God, we know that the husband has a large responsibility to fill. For Christ, for from Christ his head, he has been given a measure of authority to maintain and exercise over his wife, an authority which manifests the love of Christ for his church, his patience, his kindness, his correction, his instruction, and his provision. And as mentioned before, because of this high responsibility given to him by God, it is absolutely necessary that husbands make it their lifelong effort to meditate upon the person of Jesus Christ if they are to be faithful to their wives. You cannot be faithful outside of the Lord Jesus Christ at least to the degree that is given in Scripture. The believing husband must meditate for the entirety of his life, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He must meditate upon him. And one of the things we see in our Savior is his willingness to provide for his bride. He laid down his life, his blood was shed, his body was slain for his saints, his righteousness imputed upon our accounts. Then, as he ascended, he poured out his Holy Spirit in love, given to us in our hearts, and even now is still at work to ensure that he would fill all things. He is interceding. He is actively working. He has never stopped working, even now. As the Lord Jesus, even in his incarnation, said, even now, my Father is working and can, you can rest assured that all members of the triune Godhead are working even now. And in the husband's imitation of Christ, he is also faithful. Uh, he is also to faithfully take on the duty of providing for his wife. He is a man who understands the necessity of making provision, since, of course, as we know, he has taken his wife from her father and mother. And he has been handed the very responsibility to supply for her every need. This means she is no longer dependent on her father and mother. Though they love her so dearly, so much, they have given over that responsibility to the man who would take her as his wife. This means she cannot live without his provision and cannot provide for her own apart from the husband. He understands that from the beginning, this was the responsibility given to him by God and no one else. That he is, according to Genesis 2.15, to work and keep it. Even before the woman had appeared, he had been designed by God to work and keep it. And even after the fall, this was the order of God re-emphasized that he now must eat by the sweat of his face, including all who are under him. It's not a free-for-all, but all who, is, who are under his authority must now eat by the sweat of the man's face. He cannot not work. He must live in this God-ordained order. It is not an option. If he does not walk in this order, he lives in slothfulness. And scripture tells us that there's no blessing in the man who lives in such a way. Hence, he cannot not work. Not seeing it as a burden, of course, work is not a burden, employment is not a burden, but always an opportunity to manifest the faithfulness of God to provide for his own. And that is my encouragement to all of you husbands who are working so hard every day, never looking at, at it as a burden, 
but an opportunity to behold the faithfulness of God to you and your family. Again, we, are, we read 1 Timothy 5, and we saw that great charge of the Apostle Paul over the members of one's family who have neglected the need, in this context, a widow. But we emphasized that if this applies to a widow, much more to the members of our own household. And the Apostle Paul said there in 1 Timothy 5.8, that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is because that is not the gospel way. It is not the Christ-like way. Yes, Christ is merciful, Christ is gracious, but he is also a providing Savior. And he provided for the needs of his people. And to claim to be of him, but not to walk in the gospel way, in the context of providing for the needs of those who are without, especially for those of the household, would make one worse than a pagan who has admit to himself or herself that they do not serve God. And so it is impossible for a man to say he is of Christ, but has no care for those who are without, especially for a husband who has a wife and who has, a, who has needs that need to be met. And he does not just understand the necessity of provision, but also understands the duration of provision. That this is not for the meantime, this is not temporary, but this is life-lasting, lifelong-lasting. As long as she lives, as long as she has breath. And even covering the scenario that if she outlives him, he is wise enough to prepare for the days where he is not with her, that she may live and that she may prosper. Again, that she may remember the goodness of God through her husband. And he also understands the object of provision. He is one who provides both her physical needs and her spiritual needs. Those physical needs are straightforward, of course. Those things which promote her health and life, and those things in her hours of physical weakness that would promote her recovery, her healing. But tonight, we will spend some time in understanding the second part that encompasses the husband's duty to provide, and that is the spiritual provisions of the husband. The spiritual provisions of the husband. And these spiritual provisions of the husband promote the wife's edification, promote her Christian growth, her growth in the Lord Jesus Christ, her sanctification, her obedience to God, and her wifely role. All of it is encompassed with the husband's spiritual provision. Now we know when it comes to physical, uh, things physical, when it comes to providing for the physical things, in order to provide, a man must work. Otherwise, he has nothing to provide. I think that is pretty straightforward. But the same must be applied to the things spiritual. In order for the man to provide, he must labor in his study of the word of God. Otherwise, he will have nothing to provide her. Amen? Oh, amen? He must labor in the study of the word of God and follow the pattern of 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, a man who does his best to present himself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling and dividing the word of truth. But isn't that in the context of the pastor? Yes. But as you and I have been studying over the last couple of Lord's Day evenings, we have come to the conclusion that like a pastor, the husband is the pastor of his home. And so he must handle the word of God well. He must labor in the word of God. He must rightly handle the word of God because he must present himself approved to God. He must be like the psalmist of Psalm 119 who meditates upon God's precepts and fixes his eyes on God's law, God's ways. Husbands, if you are to provide for your wives spiritually, you must be men of the word. Again, as otherwise you will have nothing to provide her. And for our members, this is like a double dose because we talked about this on Friday. 
but it is of the Lord's will that we go over it again. And I make the same conclusion. I think the conclu- that it really does apply even to the spiritual provision of what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, 8. How much more for the spiritual things? How much more when it comes to that precious good news which brings life, which is power to save? I make the same conclusion And really with a stronger emphasis. If a husband fails to provide for his wife's spiritual needs, he indeed is much, much worse than a pagan. Because he knows the truth, he professes to be in the truth, but does not give forth the truth. And as Jesus instructs his disciples to confess him before men, he fails because he cannot even confess Christ before his own wife. Because you fail her, not only in leading her in the ways of truth, but you encourage her to everlasting destruction. It is a terrible thing to forsake your duty. You are no different than the Pharisees who convert men, who make disciples and make them double sons of hell, who make them much more wicked than themselves. You entertain darkness and say, we don't want light in our home. You will say, we will not hear. We will not love the Lord. We will not serve him. We will not walk in his ways. And I will not teach his word as instructed in Deuteronomy 6. A man who does not provide the spiritual things to his wife is a man who says, we don't need God here. And so you are worse than a pagan. Because by your neglect, you have shown no signs of, redeem, of a redeemed heart, though your lips may profess it to be. And I say that there are a lot of failing marriages, and you know this, because there are many husbands who are not men of the word. They might be excellent in their physical provisions. They might be great in their careers. They might be able to provide large portions of bread on the table, but they cannot provide the most important bread, which is that spiritual bread for the soul, for the soul. And no matter how hard you work in this flesh, your flesh cannot provide the things spiritual. And there are many failing marriages because he who is called to lead his marriage cannot lead his marriage Because he's not under the authority of the one who gives life to the marriage. And because they are not men of the word, they live under another authority. And the question is, by what authority do they they conduct themselves and order their lives? By their own. And Proverbs 14.12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Isaiah 5.21 Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. These are the men who say we are okay, we are good. I know my Bible, I do my duties. I need not to be told what to do. And husbands, I pray as we prayed that the Lord would soften our hearts and that we would be willing to receive. I pray that it would be so that we do not hide behind our pride and that you don't say to yourself I'm just doing fine for we are talking about the eternal soul that is before you if you have true love for your wife you would consider her eternal soul you would think about the state of her soul you you would be all about feeding it strengthening it praying that it may grow Not only the soul of your wife, but even your children. And husbands, you are responsible for your wife's head. Because you have been entrusted, according to God's word, to be the prophet, the priest, and the king of your home. That means you are called as one who is to speak from God to your family, to your wife. That means you are to lead in the worship of God. 
That means you are to rule in the fear of God. Prophet, priest, king. Speaking from God, leading to God, ruling in the fear of God. And there is great judgment that awaits those men who fail to provide for his wife in this way. So then, what must the husband become if he is to provide for his wife spiritually? Well, first, it is important that the man, as we assume him to be, a born-again man. Because unless he is born again, he cannot commit himself nor perform any of the things that will go after. We are in the subject where we assume that the husband has been born again. And so we have to get that out of the way, because if he is born again, these things that will be discussed will follow naturally as his heart has been redeemed by God. And so there's a lot of insight to when a man does not provide. And most of the times, he will fail greatly in his provision spiritually because he has no sights of God. He has not been born again. It's great insight to a man's state of salvation if he has truly come to know the Lord. And so if the husband is a born-again husband, then he must be a man of the word. Amen? If the husband is a born-again husband, then he must be a man of the word. John 10.4 speaks of a man who has been born again speaks of the sheep of God. And it says there that the sheep follow him for they know his voice. It means there is this natural pull of the believer to be in the word of God. Jesus speaks of the disposition of a man who's been born again in Matthew 5 or 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. And so the man has a natural hunger, a natural desire for God's word. He cannot live with, without the word of God. There is no believing husband that does not live by the word. He must live by the word. Otherwise, he has proven that he is not in the faith. And all of these things to be considered, if he is a man who hung, hungers, if he is a man who follows the voice of the shepherd, then he also heeds to the charge given to Joshua in chapter 1. And tonight we're going to be flipping pages here in our, in our Bibles, and we are going to be looking at the attitude of the man toward the word. Joshua, chapter 1. Verse 8. And look at the charge that is given to Joshua. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success you see husbands you are called not to depart from the law of God there is a clear charge that it should not depart from your mouth matter of fact you are to meditate on this word day and night that means husband if you are not a bible reader you ought to be because you follow the shepherd's voice. And you meditate it day and night. And I often get the question, Pastor, does that mean literally day and night? And then the pastor will say, well, no, of course not 24 hours a day. But I think there is great emphasis when it says day and night. The point is that you must be a man meditating on his word throughout the entirety of the day. It means it must be upon your heart. Matter of fact, it says it shall not depart from your mouth, which is another way of saying it should not depart from your heart. 
So you are a man that may not be open wherever you go, but the word of God is there in your heart and you are thinking on the word of God. As the Holy Spirit witnesses to your soul. And as a result of a man's meditation, it would lead to his carefulness to do according to all that is written in it. A man cannot be careful in walking in the way of God if he is not in the word of God. And listen to that. For then you will make your way prosperous. In walking according to the law of God, a man's way will be made prosperous. Will be blessed. In other words, it's the only way to walk. And then you will have good success. <clears throat> it's a promise for life. And so a man, a faithful husband, understands that the word of God must never depart from his heart and it must be his daily duty to go into the word and meditate upon it to carefully observe and to do what is in it that he may live. And so just exactly like what Peter said, they are words of life. And so if he is a born-again husband, then he should know that the word of God is life to his soul. And so if he's a man of the word, he knows that the word of God is life to his soul. If he is not a man of the word, he has not seen life. He does not know life. He has not tasted life. Because he does not go to the only source of life. The word of God. But the believing husband knows that the words of God is life to the soul. Again, where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John six sixty eight. right? So every day... The husband has nowhere else to go but to the word of God. And the husband must know the value of the word of God and its power over the inner man. Psalm 19, please. Psalm chapter 19. Verse 7, <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. There you have it. It is much more to be desired than anything that you may receive on this earth. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. The word of God brings forth warning. In keeping them, there is great reward, life and blessing. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. As you can see, based upon what we've read from verses 7 to 14, the word of God surely has great power and impact over the inner man. And every husband must understand that the word of God is perfect that it revives the soul, that it is sure, it makes the simple, or wise, makes wise the simple, that they are always right, his precepts, causing the heart to rejoice, and that they are always pure, always sanctifying, always enduring forever. They are always righteous. 
and by them we are warned. And every time a man places himself under the authority of God's word, he places himself under what you've just read. The effects of it in, uh, to the inner man. Uh, the Apostle John records the Lord Jesus' words in the high priestly prayer. And the man of God in the home must also know that the word of God sanctifies. It is the only thing that sanctifies. John 17, 17, please. <clears throat> and this is the prayer of the Lord Jesus before he ascends to heaven. He prays that his bride, his disciples, would be sanctified. And so take note of this, husbands, for this is the same example we must follow. But he says to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. And so the Lord speaks of his separation, his consecration of self, that he may sanctify his bride. And again, if we are to follow the example of our Lord in desire to sanctify our wives, then we must also consecrate ourselves that we may present her to God, according to Ephesians 5, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And what exactly do we wash her with? The word of God. And why are you to do so? It is not your own will you do this. You do this because this is what Jesus prayed for. Listen, if you do not sanctify your wives by this word of truth, you are going outside what Jesus himself prayed would happen for all his saints. He prays that his church would be sanctified by the words of truth. And you, husbands, must follow in line with that prayer. That you would be used as those vessels of God at home to swash her by the word of God. There's nothing else you can wash her with. And so he must know that the word of God sanctifies. But he also must know that the word of God equips and makes one complete. 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 Are you all still with me? 2 Timothy 3. And I love this. Verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see? With our pursuit to sanctify our brides. With our desire to promote her spiritual maturity, her growth in Christ. The word of God. By the working of the Holy Spirit through these words is what he uses to bring forth, again, the correction and training and reproving of your own wife as it does unto your own soul. And I hope you understand that this must be first applied to yourself. That's why I begin with the husband must be a man of the word, recognizing that the word must be viewed in this way, if indeed he has received life. I love that because by faith, or um, faith comes by hearing, and hearing of the word of God. And by the same means he has been opened to life, he runs to and sees the word of God forever as life to his soul. 
And so he understands the value of the word of God, that it makes one complete. Because, according to Paul, theonustos, breathed out by God, expirated is better. It is to say that those exact words given to us in canon, now he has the law of God in mind, but for us, who have the complete canon in our hands, Paul is really saying, in extension to us, that everything given to us here is exactly what God wanted that you may live. Therefore, you must see the value of this word, not just pieces of it, parts of it, some chapters and some books, but all of it. And really, husbands, if you are to be a man of the word, you must see to it that you indulge in and read the entirety of this word. Because it is life. But the husband must also know that these words are the same words that we will be judged by and judged with. John 12, please, verse 47. John 12, 47. <clears throat> and look at the word or words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Amen? And then he goes on to say that these words that he has spoken, he comes with the authority of God. It is from the Heavenly Father. And so the rejection of his words is the rejection of the authority that sent Christ. And so put that all together. <clears throat> the words of life sanctify. The words of life have power over the inner man. The words of life, or the word of God completes the man. And these very words will be the words that will judge you on the last day. Therefore, you must live by them. You must meditate upon these words. You must not allow it to depart from your mouth. Otherwise, the great day of judgment awaits you to your despair. Therefore, if he is a man of the word, he then sees the importance of providing these very words. Right? If he is a man of the word, then he understands that by them he prospers, by them one is complete, by them one is warned, by them one will be judged. And if he is a man of the word, then he sees the value of providing these same words of life to his wife for her life and edification. Why? Because no man hated his own flesh. If he himself received the treasure of life in his heart, he cannot withhold that from her. He must give that to her. And so we begin to, in understanding now the types of spiritual provision. The spiritual provisions of the husband must be both private and public spiritual provisions. First and foremost, private, we are speaking about that the home, the place where no one else is present but you. And in that home, God's word must be honored. You often see the signs on the walls that say, God is welcomed here. Or God bless our home. The sign is there, but the word isn't there. The word must be in the heart. And so in private, the husband must provide. And the greatest example, I think, is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where we read that on Friday. But again, I'd like you to turn there as we remind ourselves of the word of the Lord. And I know you've read this many times because pastor either brought you here many times already or you've done so on your own. But it is important that we go back to them. It is your duty, husbands, in private to honor the word of God in your homes. 
And I do believe that this same passage encompasses the wife, of course, because it goes down to the children. But look what it says here in verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lay down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. That practically covers the entirety of your home. Wherever you go in that private place, the word of God must be honored. That's really what it's saying. That means that the husband, under the authority of Christ, ensures that his home is ordered well. Where that home understands that he is the leader of his home. He is certainly the prophet, priest, and king of his home. But he is but a messenger who ensures that the authority of God's word is over their home. That his family is under the authority of the words of life. And really what that is saying is that there must be a time given for the reading of scripture and the study of it. Husbands, you must give time for the reading of scripture and the study of it at your, in your homes. We are told that you shall teach them diligently, meaning you are to be watching. You are to do this very carefully. You are to ensure you do them. And they are not expressed merely by actions, but it literally says, shall talk of them. That means you are being called by God to teach, to lead. What are you going to talk about if you're not a man of the word? Again, will we go on Google and type in, what should I teach my wife? And follow the websites. No, you need, as you labor in the physical, as you work hard to bring forth bread onto your tables, you must also labor intensely in the word of God that you may provide something to your wife, her soul. And not just the reading of them, but the study of them. That you look into every word, you look into every verse. Then you both together feast upon those Rich words of life. And there are those who do give time, but they've only made time. They never really went into a careful study of the word. And so I say that the husband cannot lead his wife in the word if he is unprepared himself. He must prepare well. Now, we must use the same standard. If he is the pastor of the home, think about the standard you expect of your pastor. That every Lord's Day, that he would prepare well to feed your souls. Otherwise, he's not a good pastor. He's not faithful. And so you too, in your homes, must prepare well to feed your wives. That means you need to spend time. You need to ensure that what you are about to say is correct. And they are not just thoughts or led by emotions. And oftentimes, instead of it being a study of the word, it is a venting hour where you just talk about what you see in your wife. It must be, you must be well prepared in the word. Why? Because you remember, you are handling the Word of God. You're not reading comics. You're not reading a novel. You're, re you're studying the Word of God, and it must be handled with respect. <clears throat> and it cannot be a random studying either. The time you give to the reading and study of the Scripture can't just be a random studying of the Word. Again, the argument between topical sermons versus expositional sermons. 
Do we want just to eat whatever? Or do we want to feast upon the entirety of God's word? And so it can't be a random study. It can't be just, well, I read this the other day on Facebook and I think it's good for us to study it. That's not how we ought to prepare. Husbands, you must see to it that you provide your wives and your children the whole counsel of God. The apostle who said to the Ephesian elders said, I didn't shrink. I didn't shrink back. I declared the whole counsel of God. May it be your lifelong desire as the Lord gives you breath to take your wife through the entire counsel of God. And just because you have a pastor doesn't mean you can say, well, pastor will do it. You are the pastor of your home. And many times the reason why wives don't understand what the pastor says is because you are not communicating truth to her at home either. So proclaim the whole counsel of God. So that means I need to be a scholar of the word. That means I need to be diligent. I need to well prepare myself. I need to give time in order to allow my home to grow in the fear and the knowledge of God. If you would only put the same effort that you do when you are preparing to build a house or to buy a house, you are putting all your efforts so that you may provide and order your home in such a way. If you did that for the thing spiritual, you would see fruitfulness in every place of your home. In addition... There must be a time given even to meditate on the words given by the under-shepherd. For that is the order of God from public into private. Remember in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What that means literally is that when they gathered together, whether from house to house, they went home and they talked about what the apostle taught. Now, my words are not the apostles' words, or what I mean by that are divinely revealed, as though I was an apostle. But I preach the very things that the apostles taught. Hence, you must go home, as the one that the Lord has assigned to be your under-shepherd, to feed your wife and to unpack the very things that have been given to you when we were together in public. I often hear... Well, pastor could have just spent more time in that area. Well, the pastor could just have said more on that subject. Well, that's the beauty of being a husband. You can go home and whatever question your wife has, and even if she doesn't have questions, you are able to unpack all of it with her. Remember 1 Corinthians 14, when Paul instructed the woman to be silent. He said that if she has any questions, she should go home and ask her husband and let him answer. Let her learn from him. That's the words that the Apostle Paul said. Let her learn from him. Is she learning from you is the question. Well, I'm telling you, husbands, if there's anyone that really should be listening to these sermons, it should be you. But many husbands are guilty of falling asleep and they have nothing to say when they get home. I say that because I love you and I do not want you to fail. You should be all the more awake when it comes to the teachings given by your pastor so that you can go home and understand why did the Lord give us that through our minister? What does he want us to know? Do we think that the pastor preaches a sermon so that you can go home and just forget it and say, hey, that was a great sermon? No, that is to go with you into the private chambers for you both to meditate upon it. And so I'm encouraged when I see you writing your notes because then I know that it's not being forgotten. 
I know that you are meditating upon those words, and I am very encouraged when I receive messages from you. Pastor, my wife and I have been talking about what have been, has been preached, whether in the morning or evening. Those are good things, but it must be consistent. And you must study well those words so that you may unpack. On one side to be Bereans, to study if those words are true, and another to see as you've unpacked them for yourself that they are rich and they are of life. Therefore, it must be given. And so, wives, really, the first person, aside from your pastor, really the first person you should go to to learn the word of God is your husband. That means, husbands, you must be dependable. You must be a resource for her. One who provides for her. And so learn well then the word of God. But aside from the word of God that one must or the husband must bring forth in the word or in the home, there also must be a time given to respond to the word of God, which is in prayer. A time of prayer must be given. What does Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8? I desire then that in every place the men should pray. Every place. And if it's in every place and men should pray, that includes your home. And because you are a man, the husband of your wife, you ought to pray and lead her in prayer. What has the Lord shown us? What has he spoken through his words? What has he revealed in our very own hearts? We sang it in our hymn, I ask the Lord that I might grow in steady Reveal the hidden evils of my heart. And as he reveals those things, how do we respond in prayer? Give time to pray. Part of this is you must also address her in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You mean we need to sing at home too? The word of God says it. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5, 19 to 20. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Why? Because it is a form of giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so whenever our brother Gord is emailing us those hymns, don't just take it as a practicing of a tune. Those are opportunities for you to look into those words together. And it doesn't have to be well, by, at 8 o'clock p.m., all of us have to wear suits and ties and dresses and we open up our hymnals and look exactly how we do at church. It could be simply you sitting together on the couch, reading through those words and seeing the faithfulness of God with what you are about to sing together as the married and together with the church when you gather on the Lord's day. That's why there is a blessing when we come together, when we hear one another sing. In one sense, we are, we are singing to God. In another, we are singing one to another for our encouragement. And so husbands follow that same pattern at home. You address her through the very faithful words of God written in those hymns that are found in those hymns. And together, when you are singing, you are thanking God for his faithfulness. And so the word must be honored, prayer must be given, addressing in Psalms hymns and spiritual songs, and these provisions must come regularly and naturally. Naturally. Not forcefully, but naturally. Again, Ephesians 5, 19 to 20 speaks of giving thanks to the Lord. It is a natural response of our heart, of the heart of the believer, to have been redeemed by God and to respond not only in himself, but with his wife, 
many thanksgivings. And so they must come regularly, naturally. Does your physical food come regularly? Like daily bread for your bellies? The spiritual provision of the husband must be regular, like daily bread for your souls. I've, I've heard some say and give counsel to their members, that's okay, husbands, as long as you have one day a week to meditate upon the Word of God, you're fine. And you'll often hear many people say, well, yeah, we have a devotional every Thursday. Do you only need the Word of God every Thursday? Is your wife only hungry on Thursdays? Do you only care about her soul on Thursday? But that is literally the way we must view it. If we eat every day, then our souls must eat every day. Because if you're not feeding the soul every day, your flesh is strong, but your spirit is malnourished. Anorexic. <clears throat> Dying. So I say regular, daily. Now, notice, I'm not giving you a, some liturgy here that 9 a.m. this, 10 p.m. this. All of the things mentioned here, must you must order in your home to what is most suitable, to what is most fitting, to where all is edified. So remember that if you don't forget to eat physically, then don't forget to eat spiritually. I hope every time you eat anything, every bite you take, you are reminded as that spoon enters your mouth, oh, I should be feeding my soul too. Amen? Yeah. Have I fed my soul yet? I will after this meal. And so order your lives, husbands, that you may supply the needs of your wives. And now I understand that the schedule might be jam-packed from Monday to Friday. And you might be limited. And you will be. Which requires wisdom then for you to portion what you can give to your wife day by day. I'm not asking you to preach an entire sermon to her every single day. But together that you portion it where there is a reasonable meditation of God's word. There is a sufficient meditation of God's word. Portion it. Be a chapter a day, section by section. But especially on the Lord's day, if you are limited from Monday to Friday, then see the importance of the Lord's day where the Lord has ordained from the beginning that that day would be blessed unto him, a blessing unto you. That if you're limited Monday to Friday, then on the Lord's day is a day to feast. Feast on the word of God. Rest in his word. And so whether this be during the break when we depart for a moment or after the evening service, that is the time, that is the day to do it. Meditate and rest upon the word of God and do not allow. You see, that's the problem. We are limited Monday to Friday and so we waste our time when it is for the Lord. Don't let pastor... Be the one doing your duty on the Lord's day. And so when you go home or eat lunch or whatever it is, rest in the word of God. But I would also advise not only to have a time to talk of the word of God and hear the word of God, but to ensure that you are constantly under the authority of the word of God in the way you conduct your life at home. 
then you have not only provided her the teachings of the word of God, but you've also provided her an example of one who is under the authority of the word of God. Again, Deuteronomy 6, laying down, rising, whatever it may be. The, on, the word of God is honored because everyone is living under the authority of that very word. And so you must lead by example as a man under this word. Don't be the husband who has a Tuesday Bible study in the evening and then he doesn't live by what he is teaching. How then, how will anybody listen to the word of God? Because it doesn't seem important to him that he must live under it. So then how would the wife be encouraged to live in that way? Now, I've taken a lot of your time this evening, haven't I? But there's a lot still that we need to go over. Not only are we to provide for her spiritually in private, but also in public. And how are you to provide for her publicly? You are to ensure that she is always receiving and always participating in the available means of grace. This is with reference to those meetings that are ordered by God and led by God's minister. And so in providing, the question you must ask is, do you make the public means of grace accessible to her? Do you ensure that your wife is always present to worship God, not man? That's the problem. Sometimes attendance is only for the showing to man. But do you, make it do you ensure that she is always present to worship the living God? Do you press the importance of her public presence? And husbands, you shouldn't be sleeping well at night if you have forsaken that duty. And you shouldn't be sleeping well at night if your wives aren't. Publicly worshiping God because you have not made it available for her to. Made it possible for her to. We see this example in 1 Samuel 1, Elkanah. And Elkanah made it possible for Hannah to go to the tabernacle of the Lord. Actually, in chapter 1, it says that Hannah often went to the tabernacle of the Lord. In chapter 2, she is seen going up with her husband to the tabernacle of the Lord. Which implies that there is leading, a leading to public worship. There is an insisting to be present. We also read of this in Luke chapter 2 with Joseph and Mary. The feast of Passover. Where the Bible says there that they went to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. Joseph ensured that Mary always came with him. And so in the same way, husbands should lead their wives to observe public means of grace, especially on the Lord's Day, where it is made available to them both in the morning and evening. Again, it is for the care of your wife. If the soul of a person is important to you, then you will understand why I say these things. And if the worship of God means more than anything else in this world, you will know why pastor speaks in this way. There is nothing to justify an infrequent worship of God, an occasional worship of God. A sometimes worship of God. There must be a regular public provision. You must ensure that you have set up all the means necessary for her to be there to worship the Lord. And what's encouraging in the example of Elkanah and Joseph is that if you read, they live towns away from where they were going. In Joseph's case, they went to Jerusalem. They weren't from Jerusalem. Same with Elkanah. Yet, despite the distance, and some of you are like that, no matter where you are, 
you're here. Despite the distance, they provided for their wives to be present where there is that public worship of God. Uh, today, you will hear of husbands who have to travel for work, and oftentimes they take their wives with them. But there's not really a proper settling or a proper committing to, a proper participating in a local body. And so they jump from one place to another, and there's really nothing settled. Or sometimes because of a work opportunity, the couple is compelled to move out into the country, maybe, or to a different city. And as much as I would like to say that every single city, every single town, and every single block has a faithful church, that's not the case, and you know that it isn't true. However, there are some who have done so, and they have resorted to just being there because it is the best that's there. Others will even motivate them to go to the closest church. We're not talking about convenience. We are looking for the closest church to the word of God. Not the perfect church, but the church of Jesus Christ, the true church of Jesus Christ, not just the church building with a name and people that gather in it. Because of our fallen world, we know that many false prophets will rise, wolves in sheep's clothing, false churches. And so I can't say that every town has a faithful church. Therefore, I would ask you to consider carefully, or yes, consider carefully your decisions. Do not create for yourself a situation where you deprive your wives from the means of grace. You might have provided for her a roof. But if you have taken her away from the means of grace, you have done harm to her soul. Amen? Hear the words of William Gouge. In his time, this was the problem. Everyone traveled everywhere. And this is what he says, or said. If men of wisdom and ability purchase or build a house for their residents... They will be sure it shall be where sweet rivers and waters are, and good pasture ground, and where all necessary provision may be had. In other words, if a man were to build a home, he would build a home where there's resource to survive. And then he goes on to say, God's word preached is a spring of water of life. The place where it is preached is a pleasant, profitable pasture. All necessary provision for the soul may be had. Do you view church that way? The true church of Jesus Christ where the word of God is proclaimed must be seen as a spring of water of life, a pleasant pasture profitable for all sheep. He goes on to say, let this therefore be most of all sought after. Let this be what you look for, primarily, the care of your soul. Remember what we read this, or what we quoted this morning. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? When you make these decisions, the most important grounds, or the the grounds on which you should make your decision is, will our souls be okay? You could have provided the world, but if you lose your soul, you have brought no profit. No profit. And so William Gouge says, let this therefore be most of all sought after, and no residence settled but where this may be had. Meaning, no decision made. No moving anywhere. Unless we know the word of God is available to our souls. Amen? Now, by providence, some of you are out of town. And you are making an effort 
to drive and to be here. And so may the Lord grant you that strength and ability to be consistent in it. See to it then, according to what we've heard, that you ensure her regular attendance in the public worship of God. And not just hers, but yours. Because if you're not there, there will be no encouragement for her to do that either. And the Lord is reasonable, but you also must be reasonable. As you have learned this morning, there is absolutely no excuse we can make to the Lord. Luke 9 is a great example of that. Will you follow him or will you not? Hence, seek to order your lives that you may worship the living God in the way that he has prescribed it to be. By this you know that you are under the word of God and its authority and not living a life that is not real, that is not justifiable. So I pray this evening, by those words, you've come to understand, and that you go home, and you unpack those words even further. Brothers, you have a high responsibility, and I pray that you may fulfill your duties faithfully. Before we go, I'd like you to turn with me to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. Husbands, I want you to go home in the fear of the Lord. You are watchmen's. Watchmen's. The standard you point at me to be your faithful pastor, I, by the God's grace, point to you now. Look at verse 18. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way. In order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. In other words, if you know the word of God, you've been given the word of God to warn those from perishing, and yet you did not do, you did not say, you did not lead them, their blood will be on your head. And your wife, her blood will be on yours if you do not provide for her the spiritual things necessary. On the other hand, it gives us in verse 19 that if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or is from, from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, but you will, have no, you will have delivered your soul. In other words, you are safe. You have done your responsibility. If at this point she does not listen after your warnings, you have done what is right in the sight of the Lord. I pray that you may receive these words in grace. These are the words of God. And these are the way, this is the way that we must conduct ourselves as faithful husbands. For this is the way of Christ. And this is how he loved his church. And if you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church, then you must do it this way. And so God help us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the words that you've given us tonight. And Lord, we indeed are nothing without you. We are far from perfect, even I, many lackings. As we examine our own hearts, there are many responsibilities that we ought to fill, but we must first start from the beginning. Are we men of the word? And we pray that we be men of the word, men who understand the value of the word, these words of life to our soul, and that being persuaded by them, the contents in them, that it would persuade us to give them to the edification of our wives, to give them to our wives that they may live too. Grant us wisdom, grant us knowledge, grant us the time, grant us the ability to order our lives that we make this provision. 
to balance earthly provision and spiritual provision, to give time to the reading and study of your word, prayer, meditation upon truthful words and hymns, and even the public means of grace, that we would order our lives to always be present, that the word of God being proclaimed behind the pulpit is really meant for the husband to take home with his wife. Make that known to each husband and each wife before they leave tonight. And even the warning you gave us here in Ezekiel 3, instill in the hearts of every husband that they are watchmen over their homes and the blood of their own wives will be upon their head. And Lord, I pray that you would emphasize the seriousness of that warning for that day of judgment is coming and you will judge each one. Keep us faithful, we pray. Keep us faithful. And because we cannot do it, we look to you, our Lord, and we ask for your help. Enable us that we may be faithful husbands. In Jesus' name, amen.